You're a big civic engagement, uh, participatory kind of soul, so I'm guessing, and I have a feeling I'm wrong, you like this. Am I? I have mixed feelings about it. Why I mean, do you have mixed feelings? Well, nobody wants to be the one that says, I'm anti-democracy and I don't want people involved. So why are you going to so do that? It's, I'm not. It's not that. It's that I do think uh, these kinds of things have to be done thoughtfully and carefully because those who are enfranchised tend to participate. The systems tend to help them participate. And budgetary decisions are moral decisions that also affect people who are marginalized and disenfranchised. And if you don't approach that with some pretty serious care, uh, you wind up doubling down on exclusion. Isn't it better, though, to be closer to the people and have a chance that they do get it as opposed to being at arm's length, even if people like him are doing a great job? I don't necessarily accept that being a representative keeps people at arm's length. I think it depends on how you execute that part of the democratic process. But I do think there's always a fine line between engagement and popularity. And the goal is to figure out a way to do it where people are engaged and we're not holding popularity contests as budget. This whole 12 thing, which I agree strikes a lot of people in a weird way, isn't it great to have young people before they can vote uh, in all other elections actually experiencing the democracy directly? Yeah, isn't actually, it likely that they may get more engaged than the adults? Yeah, I actually kind of love the 12-year-old part <laughs> because I do think we don't intentionally train people for civic engagement, and we have to intentionally and this might do train it. people. It's, it's, I, I am for people trying different things that are going to get people engaged. I just also want us to be aware that I don't want to over-celebrate inviting people who are already enfranchised to exercise got the it. option there. Okay, I got it. On quickly. Of the isn't it good that these men and women actually experience what real people experience? I'm serious, every day no, before hear, they vote on things? I hear your parallel. Well, so let's do this. Let's take all 47 people, and on 47 different random days as solo individuals, they can go out on an average day and experience what it means to take public transportation. That's one judge, one night in jail, not 47 together touting it on the news. Legalized recreational use of marijuana, 15 seconds. Yeah, I don't partake, but yes. Okay, uh, how about you? No. Why? Um, I, it's not necessary. What does that mean, not necessary? So, I mean, there's it's recreational use. Yeah. When you have a slippery slope and you're pretty sure you don't know how you're going to contain it, I'm on the side of no. Break the tie. How do they decide? How to help? I want to write a check. To whom do I write a check? Do I know if it's going to go there? It's all going to go to administrative costs. Is it going to do with rescue or is it going to deal with health problems? How do you deal with this? So, the, the one, write a check, don't send goods. So it's good that that's how people are thinking. Uh -huh. um, it, the, you know, the best, the best bet is to find an organization that was already in Nepal because they have cultural competence, they know the community, and they probably work with on-the-ground organizations who are going to be closest to the need, know what needs to be done How first. does a mere mortal know? I mean, well, I used really to run Catholic search. Charities, you no, know the so business. So I practiced this before I came here today. Yeah. I took an organization and did, did they work in you know, Catholic Relief Services? Do they work in Nepal? took me less than 60 seconds to be able to confirm that they had a presence in Nepal prior to the quake. Do we know it's not that hard people, to find out. Is it hard to tell at this stage if people are backing up their words of support with their dollars? Do we know at this early stage or we don't? No, actually there's been tremendous amount of fundraising. You're nodding your head. You know that too? How do you know? So do the fundraising entities, I mean, work with places like his? Obviously, they're raising fairly short money and places like hers, which yeah. obviously have very expensive work ahead of them. Yeah, and so the key is for the short money, the small groups, the thousands of those around the country, to take that money and find its way into partnerships among the, the major players. And in general, I'm, I'm in all for the small organizations, mm -hmm. really local, right? But in a case like this, you want the players who are talking to each other, who have longstanding history, who have teams that do disaster response across the world and know how to do this. And that's the big institutions, both the big hospitals and the big nonprofit organizations. How psychological? To make sure, are you okay? Well, and this is you know? so important because this kind of work can be done in such a way that you inadvertently weaken or disembowel the local economy and the Understood. local infrastructure. So it's got to be done in ways that leave that infrastructure stronger when you go. Because for the people on the ground, this is five, ten years, not six months, six weeks. We wish all three of you lots of luck. Adam. Is that, you know, another part of this negative aspect of having a death penalty? It doesn't really end things. It really, really doesn't end things. And from a trauma perspective, what it's going to do is randomly and what's going to feel like kind of capriciously, it's going to bring this back for us. We're going we're gonna to revisit it at times we don't want to, where we aren't necessarily ready f for it, and it won't be in our control as a collective people who have had this experience. I can totally understand why if that family was saying, 
we don't want this. We don't want to have to relive this all the time. And the appeals process is certainly going to create those circumstances. Do you, and I, I don't want to put uh, uh, this clairvoyant hat on you, but I can imagine that there are some victims who um, were for the death penalty and, and were expressed that they were for it and may in the future regret that they said it. Yeah. And yeah. that's like another burden on them. And I don't mean this in any critical way of them, no. but it does seem unfair that we are looking to them for comment uh, when they're certainly suffering uh, if from some sort of post-traumatic episodes. Yes. You know, I can't imagine their grief, but if I imagine the worst grief I've ever experienced, thinking about having to be a public figure and be on the record about anything in the throes of that grief is nearly inconceivable to me. And I think we have to be very gentle with the families who are grieving and understand nobody knows how we're going to feel and how they're going to feel three years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. And I can't imagine having to grieve in public like that. You're going to stay with us. Reporter Susan Zalkind was in the room when the sentence was read. She'll be back after the break. Stay tuned.